one. Hello, precious ones. Welcome to Kiss Time with Jesus, brought to you by COP USA. I am your host, Nina AJ. Hi, hi, children. Hi, 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 hi children hi. of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Jesus, friend, friend of, of little, little children. children. Yes, Jesus is your friend, and Jesus is my friend. Jesus, who loves all children, especially you and me. Welcome to today's program. Um, I know you are here. You have a friend that is sitting by you, mom and dad. They are all here to watch us. And I know that you're going to learn a lot and a lot and a lot. Kiss Time with Jesus brought to you by COPUSA. It is meant for children. It's meant for grownups. It's meant for you. We are all here to learn. Parents always tells me that things that they've not even, they didn't really pay attention to. When they watch Kiss Time with Jesus, that's when they get to know the deeper understanding. And I, it, to me, it marveled me. But hey, that is Kiss Time with Jesus for you. So it's for everyone, but especially for you children at home. Before we go on, we have precious ones that I have zoomed in here. Beautiful uh, princesses and prince are here with us. All the princes, y'all are here and the princesses. They are here with us this afternoon and they are going to introduce themselves. And when we are done, we also have a special guest who is going to lead today's lesson for us. So we'll start with the first person. And then when we are all done with the introduction, I, Nina Ajay, will introduce our special speaker. Okay, so the first person can start. Hello, everyone. My name is James Asay Ampofo, and I'm from PIWC, New York District. Hi, my name is Declan Afoy from Cleveland District. Hi, my name is Johanna Abba from Harrisburg District. Hello, my name is Shauna Piaminka, and I'm from Greater Grace, Dallas District. Hello, my name is Janelle Piaminka, and I'm from Greater Grace, Dallas District. Hi, my name is Darren Afoy from Cleveland District. Precious ones, you are all welcome to today's program. You are all welcome. We are in the month of October. If you look outside, God is good. Our God is so big. He's so strong. The wondrous things of God, man cannot comprehend. If you look outside, you can see that the leaves that are green are beginning to turn into orange, yellow, white, all the beautiful colors that you can ever imagine, right? Just look outside and check and you will love nature. These are the handiworks of God. Now, precious ones, in the month of October till November through December, we will see all these changes that will happen. What nature or the trees outside will bring, right? We'll be seeing. But as we enjoy all those seasonal changes, God still remains the same. The unchangeable God, we talked about that last week. Today, we have a special speaker. Most of you know him. He has been with us before. Throughout summertime, he was recording with all of you. And he's here again. Anytime he comes, he comes with a package. I love, I love, I love, I love it, I love it. And he's here again. Praise moment with him, praise moment with him. Somebody will ask, why do we have to do that? Children, if we go to church, we clap our hands and we sing. But precious ones, as we learn the word, praise, it is always important. It is always good to praise God. And Elder James is going to be the one to show us, we children, the importance of praise and worship. And he is here this afternoon with you. So grab your pencils, your pen, your notebook, and write something down. And when you are done, you can go through the scripture readings too, and it will help you a lot. Precious ones, let us put our hands together as we welcome our guest speaker for today, Elder James Deborah from Harrisburg District, New Jersey region. James, we are so lucky to have you here. God bless you for your precious time. 
Uh, that James, I will hand over everything to you and we are ready to learn from you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Auntie Nina. Hi, hi, children. Hi, hi, hi. hi. children of, of the Lord. Lord. Amen. 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 All right. Um, today we have another episode of Praise Moments with Elder James, right? And we are going to learn a little more about what it means to praise God, why we should praise God, and the impact of praise in our lives as believers. So are we ready? Let's get right into it. So Antonina, you can roll the tape. Okay. All right. So today, our lesson, um, our lesson is warfare tactics, right? We are talking about what it means to go to war. Every single day, we are in a bit of a war as people. And today we want to learn you know, a little more about how using praise as a weapon to fight. And when we fight with that weapon of praise, God empowers that weapon to accomplish great feats, amen. So if you're ready, let's get into um, our main scripture, which is Second Chronicles chapter number 20, from verse 1 to 4, and then we will jump on to verse 13 to 24. Second Chronicles chapter number 20, verse 1 through 4, and then verse 13 to 24. So um, our kind readers can take a stab at it. Hi, I am Giovanna, and I'm reading Second Corinthians chap. Second Corinth, I mean, sorry, Second Chronicles chapter mm -hmm. twenty, verse three to four from the NIV. From the NIV. Giovanna, that's one to four. Yep. Sorry, <clears throat> one to four. After mm -hmm. this, the Moabites and the Ammonites. And some of the Mennonites came to, to wage war against Josephat. Some people came and told Josephat, a vast army is coming against you from Edom, the other side of the Dead Sea. It's all, it is already in Kizan Tamar, that is En Gedi. Alone, Josephat resolved to inquire the Lord. He proclaimed a fast for all of Judah, the people of Judah, came together to seek help from the Lord. Indeed, they came from every town in Judah to seek him. Amen. All right. So we have verse 13 to 24 now. Um, I'm reading Second Chronicles chapter 20, the verse 13 to 24 from the Life Application Study Bible, which uses the NIV. So basically the NIV. Verse 13, all the men of Judah with their wives and children and little ones stood there before the Lord. Verse 14, then the spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel, son of Zechariah, the son of Benaniah, the son of Jeel, the son of Mataniah, a Levite and descendant of Asaph, while he stood in the assembly. Verse 15, listen, King Jehoshaphat, and all who live in Judah and Jerusalem. This is what the Lord says to you. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army, for, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Verse 16, tomorrow, march down against them. They will be climbing up to you by the pass of Ziz, and you will find them at the end of the gorge in the desert of Jeruel. Verse 17, you will not have to fight this battle. Take up your positions and stand firm and see the deliverance of the Lord the Lord would give you. Oh, Judah and Jerusalem, do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Go out and face them tomorrow, and the Lord will be with you. Verse 18, Jehoshaphat bowed with his face to the ground, and all the people of Judah and Jerusalem fell down in worship before the Lord. The verse 19, then some Levites from the Kohathites and, and Korahites stood up and praised the Lord, the God of Israel, with a very loud voice. Verse 20, 
Early in the morning, they left for the desert of Tekoa. As they set out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Listen to me, Judah and the people of Jerusalem. Have faith in the Lord your God, and you will be upheld. Have faith in his prophets, and you will be successful. Verse 21. After consulting the people, Jehoshaphat appointed men to sing to the Lord and to praise him for the splendor, the splendor of his holiness. As they went out, ahead of the army saying give thanks to the lord for his love endures forever verse 22 as they began as they began to sing and praise the lord set ambushes against the men of ammon and moab and mount siah and mount Sia, who were invading judah and they were defeated the verse 23 the men of ammon and moab rose up against rose up against the men from mount Sia to destroy and annihilate them after they finished slaughtering the men from Sia, they helped to destroy each other. Verse 24. When the men of Judah came to the place that overlooks the desert and looked toward the vast army, they saw only dead bodies lying on the ground. No one had escaped. Second Chronicles chapter 20, the verse 13 to 24. Please, some of the names I may have mispronounced, but uh, I'm not a team. That, that's okay. That's okay, Declan. Thank you, um, Giovanna and Declan, for doing the reading for us. So we just read from 2 Chronicles 20, from verse 1 through 4 and 13 to 24. But on your own free time, take time to read the whole chapter when you get the chance. All right. So let's get into some of the questions that, you know, a few questions that we want to ask we get into the, uh, the lesson. So my first question is, who are the Ammonites and the Moabites? These, you know, the other group was a little smaller, but the main guys were the Ammonites and the Moabites. Who are they? Any one of you want to attempt to answer that? They were relatives of Israel, but uh, more commonly known as the enemies of Israel. Like okay, and all right, and then Darren, did you want to say something? Yes, I wanted to say that um, they were they were also lot sons to grandchildren. See, so these are people who were in some way related to the people of Israel, right? And so that answers our second question, which had to do with how are they related to Israel? So they were the grandchildren of Lot, who was the what the nephew of Abraham, right? The founder of the nation of Israel. So these are people who are supposed to be like distant, like cousins, relatives of Israel. But like uh, uh, Declan rightly said, they had become enemies of Israel and throughout the history of the nation of Israel and Judah, they really bothered Israel. Amen. All right. So that, what does that tell us about our lives? That sometimes things that look so close to us, things that we have some relation or connection to, can be the source of what? Of some of the challenges that we face, right? We're talking about warfare and the fact that we can face difficulties and challenges from all kinds of places. And some of it can be far away threats, or some of it can be you know, threats or enemies that are close to us, right? So that's what we are learning from um, uh, knowing about the Ammonites and Moabites. Um, okay, Declan? Uh, first of all, Uncle James, uh, yes. uh, please, you've been saying Declan all along. It's actually Darren. One time I asked my mom oh. about it. It's because Declan's name is harder to pronounce, so they are always trying to remember. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Darren. Sorry. Hey, what, Correction, what, what, Darren. Is that when um, Giovanna was reading, what I realized was that they said from Edom. And if you read the Bible, Edom were descendants of Esau. So they're all the descendants. They're like, okay, we live in the same place. Hey, we are all relatives of Israelites. We are the relatives of the Israelites, but we hate them anyway. So let we might as well, you know, team up and go and fight them. Then this is what God did. Okay, you are going to team up and destroy my country. Let me destroy you first. And then uh, he destroyed them. Then they planted. 
All right. So, yes, you're right. Um, Edom is definitely those were the, the Edomites were the or Mount Seir were the descendants of Esau, the brother of Isaac. So you can see that sometimes you can get you know, um, you can get enemies from people who look like they're close to you or who are related to you, but some way, somehow, you find yourself in a very sticky situation or a difficult situation like the King Jehoshaphat and the people of Judah found themselves. All right, so let's keep digging into our, our passage. So how did Jehoshaphat feel when he heard of the coming army? How did Jehoshaphat feel when he heard that you have three nations, three neighboring nations coming at you? Yes, no, not Darren. Um, where are the others? James. Giovanna? Oh, Giovanna, yes, Giovanna, go ahead. I was going to say he felt very alarmed. Because he felt very alarmed. What does that mean? If well, you're alarmed, how do you feel? What's that feeling look he like? Felt, he felt frightened and surprised because if you, like, it's like telling you that everybody in your family is now coming to fight you. It's like, it's alarming and it's scary and surprising because it's like, I thought that we were all friends, but then you figure out that you're like, now like enemies okay so yes he was alarmed meaning he was afraid he was scared all right anybody else um can give us some insight into how Jehoshaphat must have been feeling when he heard about this coming army uh janelle you want to try yeah um i think that he would feel very um very scared or angry because um they all the three of them would be coming for you and i think that would be very frightening and i think he'd be angry because he probably thought they were friends until they all mm -hmm. could start coming against him so yeah. yeah so yes frightening scary and i i, I understand the angry part because if you read from verse 5 to verse 12, you hear Jehoshaphat saying that, well, the history is that even though when they were coming back from Egypt, you know, they wanted to go through the land of the Moabites and the Ammonites, but those people, their ancestors said, no, you can't come through our land. And they didn't go through the land. So it's like, okay, we didn't even touch your stuff. How is it that you want to come at us and attack us and take our land and take our property. So I definitely agree with the part about Jehoshaphat feeling angry. And you can see a bit of that anger in the prayer that he prayed from verse five to verse um, 12. All right, yes. Uh, oh, James, yes, go ahead. In my opinion, I feel bad for Jehoshaphat because I mean, he should probably have known who he was. I mean, Israel was pretty much God's country. If that was me, I wouldn't care who you are. Just touch me and see what, what God is going to do to you. Like, I dare you. I don't know what Jehoshaphat's thinking. Being scared that three people are coming against you. Mind you, this is the same God that helped Moses part an entire sea. So, again, I don't know what's going through this guy's mind right now. Well, James, the, the, I, I, I understand you. The issue here is that, see, we are human. So that was a human, a very human response. You know, it's a very human response to be afraid when things that you thought were going a certain direction don't go that direction. In the same way, it's also a human response to be afraid or to be angry about somebody or, you know, about somebody doing something that you didn't expect them to do. So it's not that, you know, Jehoshaphat forgot that he was, you know, he was the king over God's people or that, um, you know, God had, they had this great history of God coming through to save them and to deliver them. But sometimes God allows these things to happen so that like Jehoshaphat did, 
you get to call on God one more time for God to come through for you. So that's a very human and a very normal response. And I think any one of us would feel the same way. And that's why we are able to relate to it. You know, so that's why we are studying it. Yes, Giovanna. Oh, wait, no, let me go to Darren. I'll come back to you, Giovanna. Yes. Okay, uh, well, to answer James' question, I think what Jehoshaphat was like, I mean, he was a very, he worshipped God a lot, meaning that he must have been afraid that he knew God's power. So if God decided, okay, you guys name my it struggles with God, let's see what you guys did when I sent you out of Egypt. Okay, A, you decided to complain and complain and complain and complain. You forced one of the most well-known prophets to sin so that you couldn't visit the land you couldn't see the land of the israelites and then i sent you judges to help you everything everything was going well they die and then you're like they're dead let's play oh uh, let's see okay you know what then let, let me make the moabites and the ammonites destroy at least they they weren't chosen so they have every right to sin i mean it's not like i, I went there and said don't sin so they have every right to sin so they might as well destroy you so I think that's maybe one of the reasons why Joseph was afraid. And then another thing that would have made Joseph afraid is that, man, these guys have gone crazy finally. I mean, we didn't touch them. They, they, we should be angry at them. I mean, when we said, come on, let us pass, let us pass. That we will not touch anything. We'll just you know, work this place, slide by you and stuff like that. You guys said, no, 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 no. Two nations, they denied one person, chosen countries and um, passage. They denied it. The Joseph should have been very angry. I was like, no, okay. They were trying to avoid war. So I think that's one of the reasons why Joseph was afraid. Okay. All right. Okay. Good points. Um, Giovanna, I'll come to you and then I'll come back to Declan. Uh, I was going to say that he does. I think that Joseph, to James' question, I think that Joseph did understand and that he had God with him and everything. But mm -hmm. um, there are some things in the Bible where God, the person got, like the person had faith in God and everything, but God um, didn't do what he wanted for them, but he did it for a reason. So Joseph had, must have been thinking of something like that. So maybe God would make um, them destroy them for a reason. I don't know what reason, but there could be a reason why he um, would do that, so. Okay, all right, interesting point. Um, let's come back to, Sean, did you wanna say something? No, okay, all right, so let's get back to Declan and then I'll make a comment about it. Antonina, you can chime in if you want. <laughs> okay. Yes, De uh, Declan. I wanted to say that there one reason I think that one reason why Jehoshaphat, King Jehoshaphat, to be that was angry, was because first of all, two, three, actually many nations versus one nation. You know, mm -hmm. usually people say three heads are better, two heads are better than one. But in this occasion, I would say that's like uh, <laughs> three heads. Three uh, heads is overwhelming, right? Yeah, three heads is overwhelming. <laughs> by two by two, it's double. Too much. Yeah. yeah, so I well, wanted to say that the, the reason why Jehoshaphat was so was why it was because when you like see three people versus one person, it's obvious that the three people would win. But when the three people face themselves, you don't know who would win because they will go all die and you win. So okay. well. Oh. oh. You're muted. Okay. All right. I think I'll take one more comment from James about this question and then we'll, 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 we'll oh, keep Oh, I moving. was just yes, going to yes. say that um, when Dara was saying it was three people against one person, that's not true because mind you, this one person is supercharged with the power, military power of God. So it's more like three <laughs> versus 35 million because that's what I wanted to say. But that one person has also committed a lot of sins. You yeah, see? that's true. <laughs> that one person has a lot of histories. And when you read the Bible, God said, it's plain in the book, in the Bible, it says that, yes, for so, what all one person has to do is show love to me. And for the next thousand generations, it will go well. Of course, if the person does bad, the next 
four generations or so. I'm sure they will live a very painful life. So maybe Joseph was thinking about that. Let's see, what did my parents yeah. do? Yeah, okay. Do about All right. Well, but did Jehoshaphat uh, sin so, though? Uh, well, of all the kings of Judah, actually, he was one of the good ones. Okay, so that means he had nothing to be afraid of then, really. Well, you know what? Again, James, remember. Human. I, I understand. That's the point, Giovanna. Human. Um, can so, I ask All of us, all of us, all of us, no matter how filled with the Holy Ghost, you know, how prayed up we are, how much of the word of God we know, oh boy, we get afraid about things. If you are, as you, as we go through life, you know, you would find that, look, sometimes this is, you know, you have this challenge and whilst you're trying to deal with that one challenge, another one is coming at you and then another one and then another one. And you're like, you know what? I'm done. I'm done. You know, even Jesus, when he came on earth, remember, he was God, but he was human. And there was a human part of him that he showed. Because without that human part, we couldn't relate to him. So it's very important for us to understand how we are made. Because the next question, which I was going to ask, was going to look at how did he respond? Because it's okay to be afraid. But what you do in that fear, what you do when you're facing that challenge is what is important for us to learn. Um, I'll take Darren and then we'll go to that question. So, or you want to answer that question? I want to okay. answer this question. Okay, yes. what okay. I wanted to say is that- What, what well, step do you take? Well, Joseph was like, okay, well, I've heard the saying the strength in numbers and obviously the Ammonites, Moabites and the Mount Seir people, if I do got that part covered. So I return to my last line of defense or my first line of offense. Okay, God. <laughs> Then he decided to pray to God. <laughs> if you read this prayer, it's let's see, uh, seven verses long. That is a uh, very long for prayer. Like no strategy, it's not like, oh, I'm hungry. I'm going to eat at first. I mean, you can't work on an empty stomach. <laughs> <laughs> he prayed. That means that he must have been extremely desperate today. Because yeah. inquiring of the Lord, people went and lost wars here and there. And in the Bible, even David he didn't inquire the Lord every single time. Even David. He didn't inquire the Lord every single time. That means that the inquiry of the Lord was something that you only did once you, you only did once you were like extremely desperate. You knew what was at stake. So he decided to do that. And then, well, he didn't fight any battle. Literally, he, he didn't okay. lift a muscle, like okay. literally. Okay. So Darren says that he inquired of the Lord. He, you know, he, he waited on God. He prayed. Yes. Uh, let me take... Let me take Darren. Sorry, Declan. Sorry. <laughs> yes, Declan. Um, what I, wanted to, I wanted to contribute to what Don said that today, that today when we are when we are to church, my dad was preaching and he said uh, he said that when you are desperate for things, it doesn't matter about how you feel. So you know, like. When Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat was feeling scared, but he was desperate to you know to to pray to the Lord so for answers, so he did it. So that's what I wanted to say. Okay. Thank you. Yep. So yes, definitely. When you are in that position where you are backed up into a corner, you want to do any and everything. And like you know, Darren, you rightly said he turned to his first line of defense and offense, which was go to God and see God's face with the rest of the nation. James, I'll take you. Uh, I have a quick question. So back mm -hmm. in those days, right, they didn't have like a close relationship with God that we do now. Like, didn't they have to go to a temple before they were able to get access to God or something? They did have the temple. So when Jehoshaphat called for that meeting, that prayer meeting, right? They all had to gather in the temple. They did so that means that, so that means in the Bible, whenever we hear that David inquired of God, he did that at the temple, right? More likely. 
Oh, so then Darren was right. He must have been desperate because for you to call like half of all your, like almost all your officials to gather at a temple and be praying for like, you know, a long time, he must have been really desperate then. Yeah. Darren was right. So it, it, it wasn't just half of his officials. He called the whole nation. Hmm. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he called the whole nation. Listen, if you, if you read it, it says the kids, there were kids there, there are adults there, that everybody was there, right? Let's look at that. Uh, that's in verse, um, verses 13, right? It says, all the men of Judah with their wives and children and little ones, everybody was there. Because, again, like Darren said earlier, if you have three versus one, <laughs> you, are now, you are outnumbered. You know you're going down. So at that point, Jehoshaphat was like, look, I don't have enough men to fight against an army that is three times the size of mine. And so what did he do? He went to his first line of defense. He went, he went to God to go ask God's help to what? To solve the issue or to see God's face, you know, to get the help. And he didn't just go alone or just get maybe the, the Levites and the priests and a few people. No, 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 no. He said, look, this bothers all of us. This is important for all of us. And so, and so sometimes in our families, when something is happening, I remember growing up that there were times when, you know, things were difficult and, you know, when they were so difficult and it was like breaking point, my dad would call, you know, a prayer meeting and it wasn't just my dad and my mom praying in, you know, in their room, you know, for the whole situation of the family. No, he was going to get all of us involved. And if we had to fast like Jehoshaphat, you know, did, we would fast. So we are learning something, right? Kids, are, are, are we following? We're learning that when we are pushed to the wall and we are facing a very difficult thing, our first line of defense is to what? Is to call on God, is to go to God and say, God, this is the situation I am facing. I'm in a tight spot. I'm afraid. And God is okay for us to tell him that we are afraid. Right? It's okay to tell God that you are scared. It's okay to tell God that you are frightened. God wants you to tell him how you're feeling and then he can come in and address whatever your feelings and whatever your challenges are. All right, let's take that. Sorry, Dara. Okay, what I wanted to say is that, well, people say Jehoshaphat was good, but after what Uncle James or Elder James said, and, I rem and now I'm realizing that not, not all kings were, in fact, David wasn't even all that good. Because Bible says pray continuously. And then you're using God as you like, this is life or death. You're using God like that. Well, then, uh, then he wasn't all that good because you should have prayed in everything you did. That's it. Because that, that would have meant that, okay, then he probably didn't pray before he ate. He ate. No, no, Darren, he didn't say that he was the best. He said that he was one of the good ones. Yeah. And also, you have to take into account the wickedness that some of the kings did. Take a look at King Ahab and his wife Jezebel. Mm -hmm. Take into account of that. Take yeah. into account of King Saul, the first king. You would expect that being the first, he'd have all reason to give glory to God. But look at how he ended up. Even look at Solomon, wisest man in the world, and look at how he died. So he's not saying that Jehoshaphat, like Giovanna said, that Jehoshaphat was the best. But really, I think what he was trying to add on to was that the fact that he, for some of the things we see in the Bible, he was pretty good as like in terms of standing with God. Yep. Okay, so based on other kings, he was like a very good king. Yes. Yeah. That doesn't mean that he prayed like continuously, like the prophets, like Elijah who, and Moses. So, who like that. No, so, it so, just means he was one of the good ones. Yeah. But, but even being a good king, depending on your subordinate, you have to pray that your subordinate were very bad so that even if you did something extreme, 
because your support led to a very bad because considered, you know. So, 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 Darren, the 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 thing here is that again, we are talking about not angels. We are talking about human beings, all of us with our flaws and everything, and putting all of that together. When you read the Bible, right? When you read, especially the Old Testament, first uh, first Samuel, second Samuel, first Kings, second Kings first and second chronicles you would find that you know there were certain characteristics of the bad ones and characteristics of the good ones the good ones used to call on god often they used to make sure that you know the temple is running there's a bunch of things that the good ones were doing and they were making sure that they ruled with what with a fair hand and they were they were ruled justly and where you know they, they they practice righteousness but when you compare that to like james was saying some of the other kings yes you will see that yes jehoshaphat was one of those few kings of judah of israel who were the good ones so yes he was the good he was one of the good ones all right so let's move on. I haven't heard from Sean. Sean, are you good? Sean, are you okay? <laughs> I, I, I think he can unmute himself. Sean, can you unmute yourself? Maybe you see. Oh, you can, he says his microphone can... isn't really working. Oh, microphone. Okay. All right. All right. So let's go on. So. He went to God, called on God, and he received a message of reassurance. Who received the message? Who received the message of reassurance about the situation that they were dealing with? Let me see. Uh, Declan. It was Zachariah. Son of mm, it wasn't Zachariah. Okay, so sorry that but you see what I at first I didn't read it really well, so uh -huh. I thought it was Zachariah, but after reading it over and over again, I realized it is Jahaziah. Yeah. Jahaziah. It's just the son of Zachariah, but Zachariah caught my eyes since well <laughs> Zachariah who because you've seen Zachariah before, right? So mm -hmm. yes, it was Jahaziel um who received that message from god um you know reassuring them and so let's look into what did god tell them what did god tell them about the situation that they were facing and then the battle that they were going to fight what did god tell them let's look into the content of the message okay let's do janelle um god told them that they shouldn't worry because of um, he would fight the battle for them. Okay. Yep. So yes, God told them that, hey, guys, calm down. I see you're worried. I see you're scared. But I will take care of this for you. Yes. Anybody else wants to add to that? Okay, Darren. He gave them the usual, do not be afraid, do not be discouraged. I mean, once you read it, you realize that it is said over and over and over and over in the Bible. I mean, I think that was God's catchphrase. Do not be afraid, do not be discouraged. I think he likes coming to the rescue like, yes, and I destroyed them without knowing how. Okay, Darren. Darren, I, 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 I'll say something about you're saying that that's God's catchphrase. I'll come to that in a moment. James, yes. I was going to say that um, in the Bible, the word fear not is actually used 365 times. So when God is always saying, do not be discouraged, that means for every day of the year, God is telling you that you shouldn't be afraid. Amen. 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 Okay, Sean, I had your I saw your hand up. Yes, go ahead. Okay, I fixed my microphone. You fixed okay. your microphone. Good job. Uh-huh. Go ahead. So um um like um kind of so this is kind of related to Janelle's in verse 15. It said that um that um you should not be afraid or discouraged because for the battle is not yours, God is going to take care of it for you. <sighs> Amen. 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 Yes, indeed. 
God will take care of it for you. And so let me now speak to the issue about fear not, the use of fear not. Look, guys, we're going to find out as you grow. I know you're young, but even in your, you know, however young you are, think about the past one year and a half. Just think about the past one year and a half. Yes, we already knew there were things that were scary in life and accidents and plane crashes and the sickness and stuff happening already. And then suddenly we were all hit at the same time with something that we could not see, a virus. Look at how scared we have been over the past one year and a half. How that fear has crippled us and destroyed the lives of people. And people are anxious, you know, anxious about their lives, their health, their families. And think about it. People have also lost their lives. So when we are talking about things that can create fear, right, and anxiety in us, oh, there's a whole bunch. And even with every passing day, we don't even see all of it, right? We don't see all of it. If you ask Antonina, she works in you know, a healthcare setting and she can tell you there's a thousand and one things that can scare you. <laughs> a thousand and one things that can scare you. So it's actually comforting that when we are worried and we are scared and we are frightened, the first thing that God tells us is, don't be afraid. It, look, as a human being, it is one of the most calming and one of the most comforting things we can ever hear from God. And like James says, imagine you hearing it every single day. That's amazing. That's told, that tells you how much God cares and how much God is concerned about our lives, our emotional, our physical you know, our well-being in our totality. God cares about us. So the first thing he tells you when he comes on the scene is, don't be afraid, I got this. Don't be afraid, I got this. Yes. Oh, what? I'm what? glitching, Janelle. Okay, so let's hear from Sean. Sean, you had your hand up. Yeah, I was going to ask if that fell under um a Bible verse I know. Would that fall, like... um. When God tells you to not be afraid or um, um, discouraged, would that fall under Joshua 1, um, verse 9, which um, says that you should be um, strong and courageous and you shouldn't be afraid? Yes, that's one of those. Imagine, in that situation, Joshua had, was the assistant to Moses and was leading a people of almost 1. what 1.2, anything within 1.2 to 1.5 million, right? They didn't have a permanent home. They were traveling through the wilderness. There's a lot of, we all know the story. At least we know most of it. But suddenly that leader who got you out of Egypt into you know, the middle of the desert dies. And you, the younger guy, now has to take over. So Joshua had reason to be scared because he'd seen how bad things could go. So he was genuinely afraid about, you know, what was going to happen, how things are going to turn out. So it was comforting, you know, for him as well to hear God tell him, hey, be strong, be courageous. Don't be afraid. I'm going to help you through this. All right. So, yes, yeah, Sean, you're right about that. Um, let me take Declan again. Oh, sorry, Darren, not Declan, Darren. Okay, what I'm going to say is that, well, when you said that do not be afraid for Joshua, Joseph was, must have been extremely scared. I mean, you saw this guy part the Red Sea, he brought locusts, he made snakes, by snakes, snakes poisonous bites that killed almost that could have killed the entire Israelite population. He made all of that go away and then he's dead. Like, you know he's going to die, but you don't believe it until he dies. Like, exactly. Oh, uh, uh, okay, so. Um, well, so now, and, and, and before he dies, sorry to interrupt you, uh, uh, Darren. 
before he dies, God actually tells him to anoint you and prepare you as the next leader. And then I suddenly th- he's gone. <clears throat> I think even Moses himself was um, distraught. Well, who wouldn't have been distraught? Which I still don't know the meaning of. But who wouldn't have been afraid if you know, sir, okay, well, I'm going to die. Because he tried. He asked God over and over and over that even God was annoyed with him. He says, God literally says, this is written in the Bible. He says that enough, we shall speak of this matter no more. And that is when he says, okay, then Joshua will be your like succeeder. So Joshua, if Joshua had heard God's word, God said, don't be afraid. Yes, I'm the one telling you. I know you can't believe. I know it's a miracle since people go through their entire life without even seeing me or knowing me. Yeah, I know that and everything, but still, don't be afraid. Then he should have been cleared of his fear because if God is telling you, that means that he meant it. God didn't call some prophets to come and tell you, don't be afraid. Well, I believe, I mean, in that story, um, when Joshua heard that, that's what gave him the comfort and the encouragement to step up to the plate and begin to lead the people of Israel. But circling back to our passage for today. So Joshua and the people of Israel, when they heard those words from God, that reassurance that, hey, don't be afraid. I have your back. We're going to get through this. You know, um, I will fight this battle for you. It's not yours to fight. That is what comforted Jehoshaphat. And if you see the reaction that Jehoshaphat, uh, you know, the reaction that he had um, in verse 18, right? God said, hey, you guys get ready. You face them tomorrow in battle, but I got this. Verse 18 says Jehoshaphat did what? He bowed down with his face to the ground. And all the people of Judah and Jerusalem fell down in worship before the Lord. Right? So once God came in with those words of reassurance and those words of comfort, all they did was they just bow down and worship. Right? They bow down and worship. And they said, God, you know what? In this situation, we want to trust you. And that's what God is looking for from us. We will find that we'll be afraid about certain things that will happen in our lives. We'll find that, you know, we'll be worried and frightened about certain things that will happen. But the moment we hear from God and we know that God has spoken, our, next, our, our, our natural response will be to just say, God, I'm going to calm down and I'm going to trust you, right? So his words are the words that give us life and give us the strength to what? To keep going on, right? Amen. All right. So the last part of the passage tells about the fact that Jehoshaphat and his people got ready the next day. They, you know, lined up. You had all the military people, all the captains, all the, you know, the generals, you know, they all got together. And they were ready to go to war. But Jehoshaphat said, let the singers go first. Right? You're going to war. In those days, and even in today, you don't send a choir in front of the army. (laughs) Naturally, it does not make sense. But God, you know, Jehoshaphat got the insight overnight from God that, Put the army, put the, you know, the singers in front and let them sing songs of praise. And my question to all of us was, what would their enemies would have thought about that move, that decision? What do you think people would have, you know, the, the Ammonites and the Moabites would have thought about? Um, okay, why do you have the army? Why do you have the singers in front? Like, <laughs> it doesn't make sense. Giovanna, what do you think about that? I was either going to say, I was either going to say, they either would have thought that their leader was just stupid, or they would have thought that they were trying to have some cover before the, it hit the army. That's well, I yeah, think. that that's what you would have, yes, definitely. It could have been, they would have said, well, maybe they want the, the singers to be killed before the arrows or the, the spears hit the, the main army. Yeah, and maybe the, the, the commander. The king is actually really daft. Yes. Anybody else? Darren, what do you think? 
I think that maybe they were thinking, okay, so this prob- this guy's probably doing some really, really weird juju that involves the massacre of and the massacre and annihilation of choirs because maybe he hates music or something like that. Well, either that he hates music, yeah. Okay, this guy just got way too much drunk. I mean, what type of wine has he been drinking lately? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it, 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 it must have been weird. It must have been weird, um, you know, to, to see the, the singers in front of the army. It's like, really? What are you trying to do? But you know something. Yes, sorry. Than the, than, the, um, than the other people. The singers would have been like, excuse me? <laughs> you want me to do what? You know what? You might be right about that. I'm sure the singers were also a little worried about that decision too. Yes, Janelle, I saw your hand up. Um, so like about like what you said, um, you said that they would probably be surprised that, um, that they put the singers in front. Like, it's like you're just giving them victory. Okay, yep, that the singers will give them victory. James, yes. Um, I remember when David wanted to get rid of Bathsheba's husband. She he put him on the front line of the battle, where and then he told the men to draw back. So when Giovanna was saying that the singers must have been surprised, that's true because they probably had no experience in war back then. That would have been the equivalent of like a rock band or something today. And then here you have them at the front line of a potential war. That must have been interesting. Definitely, you're right about that. Um, so, it, you know, this is one of those things in the Bible that um, humanly speaking doesn't make sense. But you know, like we said earlier, and I think Auntie Nina said earlier in her introduction, our God is an amazing God. The things he does and the things he asks us to do sometimes don't make sense to us. But if we follow through and do the things he tells us to do, we will experience great victory. So that's a lesson to us that, you know, remember Jehoshaphat told them, he said, look, believe in the Lord. We already trust God that God is going to handle the situation. But God has also put people on earth, prophets and men and women of God, who guide our everyday decisions, right? And so he says, based on that, the singer should go forward, lead the army in singing as they, you know, as they approach the battlefield, right? And, you know, there are so many things in the Bible that, like, how do you part the Red Sea with an outstretched rod? It does not make sense. (laughs) <laughs> Jesus, how do you heal a blind man with spit and mud? Mm-hmm. It does not make sense. Um, somebody give me one. <laughs> you know? Uh, turning the water into wine. How do you turn water into wine? How do you raise someone from the dead? After they how do you raise someone from the dead when they've been dead for three days? Exactly. How do, you, how do you cause 10 lepers to be healed? How do you cause 10 lepers to be healed? How, how do you... Put their, put their hand in a coat and turn into um, leprosy. Um, Say that again? Just walk around. Hold on, hold on. Hold on. Giovanna, yes, go ahead. Bush. Moses in the burning bush, when he put his hand into his cloth cloak and his hand turned that leper... Lepros. Into leprosy, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So look, the Bible is full of strange things, mm-hmm. strange things that baffle the human mind. I think that one of the last recordings we did, James made the comment that, you know, whenever human beings, we are faced with something that doesn't make sense to us, we are more likely to just push back on it. No, it doesn't mm-hmm. make sense. And if it doesn't make sense, it's stupid. And so forget mm-hmm. about it. Our God seems to revel in the fact that if it doesn't make sense to the human being, yeah, that's some of the stuff that I ask you to do. So the Bible tells us in Isaiah that the ways of God are higher than our ways 
and his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. So to go to battle or to face a situation and then God said, sing about it, sing to me. When you're facing, you know, maybe you're about to lose your home or you're about to lose a marriage or, you know, you're about to fail or you're struggling in school or whatever the issue might be. And God says, sing to me, sing songs of praises. It doesn't make sense. And like we, we, we learned in our last recording on, uh, about, uh, on praise moments that, you know, Paul and Silas found themselves in a prison, whipped up, beaten, you know, slapped, spat on, locked up and everything. And yet in that moment, they began to sing. And when they began to sing, then what? Things started happening. Same way, if you read, you know, um, if you, we, we read the rest of the, of the passage, you realize that the Bible says that what? That when they began to sing and they said, give thanks to the Lord oh. for his love endures forever. Hallelujah. And you know, one thing I noticed about this, that every time Israel faced a difficult situation, this song shows up. In my studying of the Bible over the past several years, I noticed that every time Israel faced a difficult situation, they always sang this song because it was like, they are reminding God that God, we're giving thanks to you because your love endures forever. Mm -hmm. James, you made a comment earlier that, you know, why should Jehoshaphat be afraid that God, these are the people of God. God loves his people and he will protect his people and he will care for his people. Exactly right. So what did they do? They just reminded God of his faithful love to Israel. That's all they did. And that's all that God is asking us to do when we are faced with a difficult situation. Remind him that he has this faithful covenant of love to us. He has a faithful, look, God is faithful. And all he's asking us to do like Israel did and Jehoshaphat and his people did was to remind God, your love never fails. You know, your mercy is over us. Like we sing in our, in our famous greatest, our Lord God, right? Your mercy is over us. All your works are praising you. We are always thanking God for who he is. And as we mm -hmm. do that, you see the results, right? We saw the mm -hmm. results. God set ambushes. So Moab began to fight Ammon. Ammon began to fight Moab. And then what? It was total destruction. They destroyed themselves. So that's what we are learning. That when we are faced with a difficult situation, we need to remind God of who, of what? His faithful love to us. And when we do it in song, it relieves our hearts of the stresses and anxieties and the pressures. And we see God work wonders in our lives. I saw a couple of people's hands while I was speaking. Uh, was that Darren? Yes. Uh, yes, go ahead, Darren. Go ahead. I forgot what I was going to say. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Anybody else want to add something to what I've said so far about the end result of the praise? Okay. So yeah, they came together and they began to, you know, they saw they saw God do things. So our last question for our passage for today is that how can we use praise when we are facing battles we don't have control over? How do we use praise? Giovanna, is your hand up? Go ahead. Um, we can use praise to, um, well, there are many different uses for praise. You can use praise to, um, there are some songs that make you feel closer relationship with God. And then there are other songs that you can also like pray to God and they help you pray to God about it. So if mm -hmm. you're having a tough battle, you can use the ones that will help you pray to God um like great is your wait i'm not sure if that's a if that's a worship i, I mean that's a worship or a praise song i think greater is your name is a worst praise song praise shops song so i think that's a praise song but um yeah so i think that 
when you have praises to help you um, pray, I think it just makes your prayer and your word stronger. Mm-hmm. Knowing that you're just not always saying words, you're using like song, you know? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Good job, Giovanna. Yes. Anybody else? James. Even though De- um, Benedict is in here, one of the times he says that we were supposed to worship God in the highs and lows, or like praise God in this context, praising God in the highs and lows. And we see that um, that's what Jehoshaphat's doing. Even let's take a look at an example of David, right? Um, the Psalms, almost all of the Psalms and Psalms are written by David, meaning that almost like out of the hundreds of Psalms, all of those are praising God. And mind you, look at how many battles David has won. So this person once said that to succeed, you must take a look at the strategies that some people use to get success. In this yeah. case, if you want to be victorious in your life, or at least you want to like, you know, not have too many problems, one way to do that is by worshiping God. The same thing um, that we see with Jehoshaphat, once he was able to bring the singers, that they was able to win the war. One thing I also wanted to say was um, the power of music, right? Um, by you, there's this, mother, there's this weird thing my mom does, right? There's just that some, sometimes just nowhere that she starts like singing songs randomly. And everyone in my house is looking at her like, because <laughs> it's just weird. Like we're here talking with you and then next minute we give glory to the Lord. I'm like, mom, what's going on? But the thing is, sometimes when you're singing a song, the Holy Spirit himself brings that to you, like, you know, for you to use it as a form of worship. And maybe something in the lyrics of the song, that Mm. could be a form of prayer. So let's say you're praying and you don't know what to say, but there's a song that talks on your topic and you're singing it. You've, in a sense, you've prayed to God. So I also wanted to say that too. Amen. Amen. Definitely. And definitely, David. Uh, James, that ties into what Giovanna was saying, that sometimes we don't even have the words or we are trying to figure out the words to use to even pray or to say something to God about how we are feeling. But a song captures how we are feeling or a song captures the words we want to say to God, right? And so in that moment, whilst you are, you know, the Bible says that when when, when you are happy, praise God. And in the moment of trying to praise God, you're thinking, what should I say to God? Or what are the words I can use that would really capture how I feel about who God is to me? And so we have, you know, you know who was, um, I think it's Donnie McClure King has a song says, I call him faithful. Lord, you are faithful. Faithful you are to yeah. me. I call you holy. Holy you are to me. You know, and so all these different songs that we have and James to your point the power of music sometimes we don't even know what how we can't even formulate words to pray Mm. but a song brings up the words that you want to say to God and sometimes the song is your prayer the song is your prayer and that's how you communicate to God and tell God how you're feeling and the more you sing it the stronger you feel in your heart that you're really connecting with God and you're really pouring your heart out to God. Yes, Dar- uh, Darren, I'll take you. Okay, what I think what God was trying to do when he says praise me was that, I think God was like, you know, just remind me of the things I've done. So when people were praising, they'll probably be like, you parted the Red Sea. <laughs> Sorry for my terrible voice, but... And <laughs> like, I was like, oh yeah, I did. then God will be in heaven like, ever doing that that did grant me a lot of praise like a lot i mean uh-huh. Miriam, they sang a whole song they danced and everything wonder how that must have been 75 and dancing but still they did all of that then and then after that then this go okay yes you healed this guy you did all of this then yes okay oh, so then it's been it's been a day since i did something awesome i might as well go down go down to it and you know and finish something amazing right a few armies. So, <laughs> it's all in a this way. Yeah. 
Yeah, definitely. So as we as we connect to God in those moments of praise, the whole idea of this, you know, this segment is as we connect to God in those moments of praise, we are saying to God, you, you are an awesome God. You know, you are an amazing God. And we, 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 we really don't want you to forget that, right? We don't want you, God, to forget that you are an amazing God. You are, you are a wonderful God and there is nothing you can't do, right? So like um, we have this beautiful song that we all wanted, to, we wanted to share with everybody um, if you guys are ready. Uh, but before that, if we can just review Antinina, our memory verse for the day, we're talking about warfare, um, our memory verse. Yes, there we go. So um, 2 Corinthians 10, 3 to 4, this is the Apostle Paul speaking to the church in Corinth. Then he was telling them that for though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. So that means that we have battles we fight. Every one of us has a battle or will have a battle that we have to fight. But the, the question is strategy. How do you fight the battles that you, know, you, you face? So Paul says, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. So it's not a intercontinental ba uh, ballistic missile, nor is it a AK-47, nor is it a handgun, nor is it an arrow or a spear. No, the weapons that we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, it says they have divine what? Power. They have divine power to demolish strongholds. So the whole idea of why we are using praise is that praise is one of those weapons that when it is empowered by God, can accomplish amazing things. So if we can just go through our memory verse for the day, can I have one person to read it? And then we will all recite it together. Um, maybe, let's see, maybe Sean. Sean, would you be kind enough to read our memory verse for us? Read it out loud. And then after he's done, we will all read it together. Sean, are you there? <laughs> yes. So, Sean, yes. If you can read our memory verse for today, and then after we're done, um, everybody's going to say it, all of us together. Okay. Um, Second Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3 to 4, right? Yes. Okay. This is also from the um, New International Version. Mm -hmm. um, verse 3, 4... For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. Verse 4, the weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. Amen. 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 All right. So, guys, all of you, you can unmute, and then we all going to say the, the, the verse, and, you know, we'll say it all together. So, if we can all unmute. Unmute yourselves, everybody. Everybody unmute. And then on the count of three, we all go 2 Corinthians 10, 3 to 4. Ready? One, two, and three. 2 Corinthians, Corinthians chapter 10, 10 verses 3, three to, four. to 4. So we live, so we live, we live in, in the, the world. world. We do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. Amen. 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 And amen. Thank you, guys. So let's remember that. Praise is a weapon that we fight with. So when you're facing a difficult situation, we fight with the weapon of praise. So when we fight with that, we accomplish great things. So if we can go through our song, everybody ready? So you guys will have to unmute yourselves. Um, 
or maybe you can mute yourselves for now and then we'll just go through the song. I'll take it through and then we can all sing it together. Ready? All right. So this song is uh, uh, a blessed gift from our former chairman, uh, Apostle Professor Opoku Nina. And it goes like this. Who is like you in power and glory? Who is like you majestic and splendorous? Who is like you in beauty and radiance, my Jesus, the shining one? Who is like you in power and glory? Who is like you majestic and splendorous? Who is like you? In beauty and radiance, my Jesus, the shining one. Shine on me, bright morning star. Shine on me, my closest friend. Shine on me, Jesus. Shine on me, shine on me, bright morning star. Shine on me, my closest friend. Shine on me, Jesus. Shine on me. Everybody got it? Yes. Yeah. All right, so let's go through it real quickly. Did someone say something? Okay, all right, so let's go through it, all of us together. Who is like you? Ready? One, two, and go. Who is like you in power and glory? Who is like you, majestic and splendid? Who is like you, in beauty and radiant? My teacher, the shining one. All right, let's take one more time. Who is like you in power and glory? Who is like you, my best and splendor? Who is like you in beauty and radiance? My Jesus. Shine, shine on me, shine, shine on me, me. bright morning, morning star. Shine, shine on me, my closest friend. Shine on me. song for today and we just want to encourage you that as you go through the week whatever you face whatever challenge you're facing whether you're taking a test 
whether you're trying to get to school, whatever challenge you're facing with, remember, you have a weapon of praise. And once you begin to use that weapon of praise, and you begin to sing songs that, you know, raise God up, God will come through and accomplish great things. Amen. 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 God richly bless you. Our elder James, God richly bless you. Power, weapon of praise. Weapon of praise. Precious ones, I always say to my kids and our Sunday school children that I teach all the time that when it's time to praise God, when it's time to worship God, it is always important to get involved and be part of it in praise and worship him. And this afternoon we've been taught, we have gotten to know that weapon of praise, when you worship God, when you praise God, his presence comes down. And in the story that we talked about in 2 Chronicles 20, 1 to 4 and the 13 to 24, we have realized that Jehoshaphat did not only use, he didn't go mobilize um, like army soldiers with weapons and all those things to go fight the people like what the militaries do. But here, because of his faith in the Lord, because he knows who is behind him, he did not depend on his own understanding. He followed the directions of God. And through the directions of God, it didn't make sense. It didn't make sense to man. I'm sure it didn't even make sense to him. But because he knows who he serves, because he believes in the almighty God that you and I, serves he depended and he acted on those directions and they what victory was this victory was this the power of praise and worship they worship so they they worship god they sang songs and through that they defeated their enemy precious ones do not just let this sermon or this lesson end to you just sit down and read if you have any question, text us, let us know, or ask your Sunday school teacher. But I love 2 Chronicles chapter 20. I love the whole chapter on it. All. I just love it. Weapon of praise. There is power in praise. When we praise God, when we worship him, his presence comes down. And when his presence comes down, it doesn't just come down. It does wondrous things. May the Lord bless us all. God richly bless you, Elder James, for blessing us this Amen. afternoon. And we know when we call on you next time, you will come and give us a powerful one. And precious ones at home and here, let us practice the song. It is always good to learn new songs too. So let's practice. You can record and send it to us and we'll play it on Facebook for you. So precious ones, God bless all of you. May you have a safe week and have a fantastic evening. Until then, it's bye. We love you all. Bye for now. Bye. Bye, bye. bye everyone. We love bye. you all. Bye.